Romeo and Juliet is a play of opposites, so it's therefore quite fitting that its greatest advantage is also its greatest weakness. It is by far the most popular, yet equally the most cliched of all of Shakespeare's plays. Everyone, regardless if they know anything about Shakespeare or not, will recognise the iconic balcony scene, or be able to quote at least one line, it's just been ingrained so deeply into the popular culture. A very popular tagline for the play is, the greatest love story of all time, but if you've actually read the thing, this can seem a bit odd. You know, it's not exactly the picture of an ideal relationship. These cultural snapshots tend to condense the surprisingly complex themes of the play. For example, the reason I love this play so much is because of the way Shakespeare uses brilliant wordplay and sarcasm via the younger characters to poke fun at, pun, and constantly undermine tradition and the older characters. But for most people, they would never think about that when you say Romeo and Juliet. As I said previously, I think Romeo and Juliet is best understood as a play of opposites. After all, the original title in full is The Excellent and Most Lamentable Tragedy of Romeo and Juliet. You know, pretty mixed messaging. There are lots of identifiable themes, but they always appear as dichotomies. Capulet and Montague, youth and age, life and death, the bridal bed and the grave, appearance and reality, love and hate, light and dark, purity and vulgarity, idealism and practicality, just to name a few of them. And some of these ideas are surprisingly modern for the time, though constrained by the traditions of the period and ultimately rebelling against them. Shakespeare, unlike Brooke in the original poem, does not present the lovers as sinning or incorrect, quite the opposite. The audience is clearly supposed to sympathise with them, not the establishment. They are presented as the solution to the problem of the feud in the very prologue of the play. I mean, Juliet, despite being 13, is presented as extremely mature, both intellectually and to the horror of Puritans in the coming decades after it was first performed, sexually as well. Despite having less lines than Romeo, she is by far the more active agent in the relationship. She is the one who persuades Romeo to marry her, and the one who seeks a way out once she gets trapped by her betrothal to Paris. It's a stark contrast to Romeo, who oscillates between brooding and crying throughout most of the play, and as an agent, is most often acted upon by Benvolio, the friar, and Mercutio, rather than making his own decisions. There is a question, though, as to whether their deaths are a foregone conclusion, a result of fate that could never have been changed, or whether their deaths could have been avoided. Now, at first, it seems obvious that this was preordained. I mean, it's in the damn prologue, after all. However, there's this theory, proposed originally by the big daddy of logic, Aristotle, that tragedy has to be inevitable and unpreventable in any way. You have to see it coming from an absolute mile off. So, for example, Macbeth was always going to end up dead. There's even a prophecy about it. And Hamlet was always going to kill his uncle, even if it took him the whole damn play to get on with it. Whereas in Romeo and Juliet, a lot of things happen seemingly by accident and by chance. That they even meet at the masked ball is fairly improbable. Then we get Mercutio's death, which is almost certainly an accident. And then, of course, we get goddamn Friar John, who gets quarantined just too long so that Romeo misses Juliet, waking up by mere minutes. A lot of coincidences for the working of Mistress Fortune. I mean, there's a lot of miscommunication that propels the plot. It's not Othello levels of miscommunication, but it's a decent amount. You know, it's often remarked that for the first two and a half acts, Romeo and Juliet is actually a comedy. And when you look at it, it kind of is. It's only when Mercutio's death happens that the play switches gears into the darker themes that it's more well known for. Take Much Ado About Nothing, a similar Shakespeare play, with a very similar structure in the sense that right in the middle of the play, there's a big tragic turn. Yet in that play, it's resolved so we can call it a comedy. But in this one, Everyone dies, so we call it a tragedy. 
Romeo and Juliet is kind of the black sheep of Shakespeare's well-known tragedies. A.C. Bradley, the famous Edwardian Shakespeare scholar, excludes Romeo and Juliet from his lecture series on Shakespearean tragedy, instead choosing to focus only on four plays, Hamlet, Macbeth, King Lear and Othello. While some have said this is due to Romeo and Juliet having less mature themes than the other four, I think it's more likely that it simply doesn't fit neatly into this classical Aristotelian definition of tragedy. I mean, the play is undoubtedly tragic, but does that make it a tragedy? It also differs from the other four in that there is no real main villain driving the plot and opposing the protagonist. I mean, you could argue Tybalt, but he's clearly a side character. And as I said in the synopsis, he's far more of an angry cat man than an Iago-like mastermind. Tradition and the feud are the real antagonists more than any actual person. And pretty much every character, even Tybalt when you play him right, is sympathetic at some point in the play. Arguably, this makes it a bit more human and grounded than some of the other more grand tragedies. Another thing to note structurally about the play is how heart-pumpingly fast it is. The audience has no time to breathe. The first scene's a fight scene, then we go straight to Romeo. They fall in love by the end of Act 1, they're married by the end of Act 2, but Kusho and Tybalt both die in the very next scene. Second Romeo is out of her bedroom, Juliet gets abused by her parents, and then two scenes later, she's faked a suicide to get out of marriage, and finally, we spiral towards the last scene where event after event after event rolls on seemingly with unstoppable momentum. This is an action-driven play. If you're looking for some deep, contemplative thoughts about the nature of human existence, you're not going to find them here. The plot takes place over about four days, like 94 hours if you follow the main action. Now you can stretch it to a week maybe if we take some of the smaller lines into account, but it's not a lot. This, this theme of speed and time even come out in the language. Supper is done and we shall come too late. I fear too early for my mind must give some consequence yet hanging in the stars. I have no joy on this contract here tonight. It is too rash, too unadvised, too sudden, too like the lightning that doth cease to be ere one can say it lightens. Wisely and slow, they stumble that run fast. Swifter than his tongue, his agile arm beats down their fatal points, and to it they go like lightning. Gallop apace, you fiery-footed steeds. This style of language it has also separates it from the grander tragedies. It's often called very lyrical in style. Being one of his earlier plays, it still carries some of the hallmarks from styles more popular in previous years. Uh, rhyming couplets in the middle of speeches, for example. Well, in that hit you miss, she'll not be hit with Cupid's arrow, she hath Diane's wit, and, in strong proof of chastity while armed, from love's weak childish bow she lives uncharmed. She will not stay the siege of loving terms, nor abide the encounter of assailing eyes, nor ope her lap to saint seducing gold. Oh, she is rich in beauty, only poor, that when she dies, a beauty dies her store. It gives the play a more melodic, poetic feeling, a feeling shared with a Midsummer Night's Dream. Indeed, they share a lot. Even the double suicide ending shows up in the play within the play at the end of Midsummer Night's Dream. Pyramus and Thisbe believe each other dead and thus kill themselves. There's some argument as to which of the two came first. We know that they were written at similar times, but was Pyramus and Thisbe the inspiration for Romeo and Juliet or a retroactive lampoon of his own work? Of course, this shared lyrical style peels off as Romeo and Juliet advances. As the lovers mature, so does the play and its language. Romeo's final speech is far more akin to something you might find in Hamlet and in his early poetic musings. Why art thou yet so fair? Shall I believe that unsubstantial death is amorous and that the lean, abhorred monster keeps thee here in dark to be his paramour? For fear of that, I still will stay with thee, and never from this palace of dim night depart again here. Here will I remain with worms that are thy chambermaids. Oh, here will I sit up my everlasting rest and shake the yoke of inauspicious stars from this world-wearied flesh. Conventional wisdom is that Romeo and Juliet is Shakespeare refining his style. After all, Romeo and Juliet is only a second tragedy. And so the idea is that he kind of learnt from his comedies and perfected this unique tragic style that we'd later see in the big tragedies. However, as captivating as that sounds, 
I'm always somewhat reticent to ascribe any biographical details based on literary analysis. Shakespeare can be so goddamn mysterious and it's tempting to build our idea of him off what we see in the plays, but you have to be careful that you don't end up analysing your own speculation and reading it into places where it doesn't really belong. You know, stick what's actually in the text. So even though it can be considered, and has been considered, immature as a tragedy by certain critics, I'd argue that's a very narrow way of viewing at it. It's a very witty play, arguably the wittiest of the tragedies, though I think Hamlet could compete, of course. But Shakespeare plays with language so much, there's almost too many double meanings to count. Essentially, every word that comes out of Mercutio's mouth is a pun, a double entendre, or some kind of clever witticism. Of course, this both reinforces that theme of opposites that runs throughout the play, but it also makes it funny. You have to bear in mind that it's got to be entertaining at the end of the day. Like King Lear might be considered more textured and richer by critics and professors, but there's a reason Romeo and Juliet is as popular as it is. There's more emotions flying about, it's more human and relatable and entertaining. Like much else, what's in language tends to be reflected in the structure, so the constant ironic punning lines up with a multitude of ironies scattered throughout the play. The feud that causes their death ultimately ends with their deaths. Lawrence facilitates the marriage in the hopes it will end the feud, and indeed it does, but you know, just not in the way he intended. Romeo crashes the party in the hopes of seeing Rosalind, yet falls for Juliet straight away despite proclaiming to Benvolio that seeing others would only increase his love for Rosalind. Likewise, Benvolio's plan to get Romeo's mind off Rosalind works, but ironically leads to the death of his best friend. And Romeo's refusal to fight Tybalt as he now views him as a kinsman, leads only towards both Tybalt and Mercutio's deaths. I mean, in the 1968 film version, um, the Mercutio and Tybalt scene is clearly just a play fight, but Romeo jumping in in case something accidentally goes wrong is actually what causes things to go wrong, ironically. And obviously the irony that had Romeo receive the message from Friar John, God damn it, Friar John, he would have known Juliet lived and not killed himself, and had he arrived a little bit later, or Lawrence arrived a little bit earlier, and they would have found each other alive and it would have been a happy ending. And it's so, so close. As, as Cedric Watts puts it, Juliet, yet to awaken, lies in the chamber of death, now accompanied by the corpses of Romeo, Paris, and Tybalt, their youth mocked by the bones and skulls around them. None of the other plays, with maybe the exception of Othello, utilise dramatic irony so effectively to highlight this feeling of tragedy that could have been avoided. There's a brilliant moment in Basil Ehrman's version where Juliet wakes up just before Romeo kills himself. She smiles and he sees her just as he's dropped the poison and we as the audience the whole time are going, no, no, come on, just look down you idiot, or just say something to him, come on, you're so close and that feeling of wanting it to change despite knowing that the outcome is going to happen anyway is an example of how well Shakespeare uses this irony to get a reaction out of the audience. As I said before, Shakespeare plays a lot with language in this play. You even see it in the names he changes from Brooke's original poem. So Romeo was originally Romeus, but Romeo means pilgrim, hence the choice of metaphor in the first kiss with Juliet. My lips, two blushing pilgrims, ready stand to smooth that rough touch with a tender kiss. And then Mercutio is a bastardization of mercurial, meaning sudden or unpredictable changes of mood or mind. And, you know, that's, that doesn't sound like Mercutio at all, if you ask me. <laughs> and then Benvolio obviously resembles the word benevolent, which further backs up my belief that he is indeed the best character in the play. In terms of specific imagery, Romeo and Juliet uses mainly the images of light and darkness, night and day. Away from the light steals home my heavy son, and private in his chambers pens himself, shuts up his windows, locks fair daylight out, and makes himself an artificial night. Juliet is almost always associated with the day and light in these metaphors. Oh, she doth teach the torches to burn bright. It seems she hangs upon the cheek of night as a rich jewel in Ethiop's ear. Beauty too rich for use, for earth too dear. Of course, if we assume that light can represent Juliet, then Shakespeare foreshadows their meeting at the start of 1-4. Give me a torch, I am not for this ambling. Being but heavy, I will bear the light. 
another double meaning as it happens, and an irony as well, because he can't bear the light that is her love. They both die. Also, when he says earlier, for Earth too dear, he is foreshadowing her death. She is so dear to him that indeed she will not be on the Earth much longer. A grave, oh no, a lantern slaughtered youth, for here lies Juliet, and her beauty makes this vault a feasting presence full of light. Because Juliet makes use of this too. In what I think might be my favourite passage of the play, Juliet compares Romeo to the stars and says he'll be so bright that people will forget the sun and desire the night instead. It's darkly ironic, considering what happens later in the play. He did, he did love his foreshadowing, did old Shakespeare. Come night, come Romeo, come thou day in night, for thou wilt lie upon the wings of the night, whither the new snow on raven's back Come, gentle knight, come, loving black-browed knight, give me my Romeo, and when he shall die, take him and cut him out in little stars, and he will make the face of heaven so fine that all the world will be in love with night and pay no worship to the garish sun. Oh, I have bought the mansion of a love, but not possessed it, and though I am sold, not yet enjoyed, so tedious is this day, as is the night before some festival to an impatient child that hath new robes and may not wear them. Light, of course, is only useful in contrast to darkness, and we see a use of this at the end of the play as well. A glooming peace this morning with it brings, a sun for sorrow will not show his head. Darkness is also associated with Rosalind at the start of the play, drawing a sharp distinction between her and Juliet. After all, it's argued, and I fully agree, that Romeo was not in love with Rosalind, simply in love with the idea of love itself. And Juliet, if you'll pardon the pun, enlightens Romeo to the realities of love. And finally, if you push your analysis far enough, you can see how Shakespeare starts to undermine the very concept of language itself. "'Tis but thy name that is my enemy. Thou art thyself, though not a Montague. What's Montague? Tis nor hand, nor foot, nor arm, nor face, nor any other part belonging to a man. I'll be some other name. What's in the name? That which you call a rose by any other word would smell as sweet, so Romeo would, were he not Romeo called, retain that dear perfection which he owes without that title. Oh, Romeo doth thy name, and for that name which is no part of thee, take all myself. Juliet questions what a name even means, how it is simply an arbitrary title, and she sees no use in it. It is a rejection of tradition and family, a reflection of how the pair will go against the, both their families and the traditions of the time throughout the play. Of course, the difficulty of rejecting names as a concept means she and Romeo have nothing to hold on to. As Romeo finds out later, his name is inexorably linked to him and he can't remove it as much as he might try. As if that name, shot from the deadly level of a gun, did murder her as that name's cursed hand murdered her kinsman. Oh, tell me, friar, tell me, in what vile part of this anatomy doth my name lodge? Tell me that I may sack the hateful mansion. It encapsulates the struggle they find themselves in, caught between two worlds, wanting to reject one, but never quite being able to separate themselves from it. Of course, there are many, many, many more themes, motifs, and images to analyse and pick apart within this play, but this is merely a YouTube video and I can't cover everything nearly as much as I'd like to. Um, all my sources will be linked in the description if you want to do any further reading, along with my synopsis video, which goes over just the plot of the play, and also I'll put in some productions of Romeo and Juliet that I particularly recommend. Um, so if you enjoyed my inane ramblings, please do give this a like, because next week I'm coming back with an examination of the historical context and historiography um, behind Romeo and Juliet. Should be interesting. Uh, so please do stick around and subscribe and uh, stay safe. Alack the day when one begins to beg, when the powers above thou hast to bribe, but if thou this fine channel wish to peg, then good fellows, I implore you, subscribe. Alas, but still thou shalt not be informed if this author a tale he has to tell. My heart would thus be eternally warmed if, like cries of yore, thou rings the bell. Last, if thou finds an item thou dost enjoy, allow me yet another deal to strike. 
thine patronage I would seek to employ. Therefore, fine friend, feel free to drop a like. But now we end, and I wish thee luck, and pray thou friends, forgive this rambling 